Holy Spirit beside us is more important even the Holy Spirit inside us is more important than Jesus beside us. We can't live this life in our own strength, can we? But there are many who are trying and find it extremely frustrating and defeating. So we're going to talk about how to turn on the power in our lives. We're going to focus in on Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 this morning, and we're going to methodically uh, go through that chapter in the next four weeks. You guys remember, this goes back a ways uh, toward my childhood, but there was, a, there was a fella, I read about it just recently again, who was out uh, selling vacuum cleaners. Any of you guys old enough to remember Kirby vacuum cleaners? Yeah, you just dated yourselves, I'm going to tell you right now. And this fellow was so uh, excited, he just got, if you remember the account, he got his first regional area. Uh, and they, in the old days, they'd go door to door. Remember that? The old Kirby vacuum cleaner guys, they'd just go door to door. You didn't have to go to the mall. You didn't even have to push the button on Amazon. You know, he would just come push the button on, your ring, on the doorbell. And uh, he got this new region in rural East Tennessee, out in the boonies. But he didn't mind that. He was just excited, and he believed in his product. And if you recall, he goes up to the first house, way out in the boonies, rings the doorbell. This, uh, I don't know, 50-year-old farmer's wife comes to the door and says, Madam, I'm, I'm Bill Smith, and I've got the greatest vacuum cleaner on the face of the earth. You know how they go. And uh, it can cut your house cleaning in half, and you've never seen the light. Can I just have a half hour to show you this wonderful machine? And so she lets him in, and as soon as he walks in, he sees that she didn't have carpet, but she had these big rugs, and, and uh, it was pretty uh, worn, and off to the corner was this big old giant dust ball with hair and pet fur and dust mites, and oh, man, it looked terrible. And, and he, uh, he says, ma'am, you see that, that uh, dust ball over there? He said, my vacuum cleaner can clean that up in 10 seconds. And he said, you sure about that, son? He said, 10 seconds. Anything that's left after 10 seconds, I'll eat it myself. <laughs> he said, you sure about that, son? I am totally confident about this vacuum cleaner. And, uh, and she says, well, well, son, you better get your knife and fork out. And he says, what do you mean? He says, I don't have any electricity in this house. <laughs> in fact, half his region didn't have electricity in their house. You know what that salesman's problem was? He couldn't plug into his power source. A lot of Christians like that. A lot of Christians trying to live this Christian life without plugging into their power source. Now guys, because I only have four weeks and you guys know me, I usually go six, seven, eight weeks. I've been known to go 15 weeks. I only got four weeks, so I am going to take an entire series right now this morning and cram it into the next half hour. Are you ready for that? I want to talk about ten things you got to know if you're going to turn on the power in your life. We're going to move fast. You ready? Number one, write this down. If you're going to turn on the power in your life, you have to be in right relationship. Write that down. All this is going to come from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. You have to be in right relationship before you can get the power turned on. And I want you <clears throat> to look at the very first phrase of verse 4. On one occasion, while he, Jesus, was what? While he was eating with them. In other words, every one of these disciples who are about to get the power turned on in their life, before that happened, they were all in relationship with Jesus. Before you can get the power turned on in your life, you have to be in relationship. Now, I want you to notice something about their relationship. It wasn't perfect. In fact, if you read through the, the previous three years, there were times he was ticked with them. 
And they got into arguments with each other. And, and they let him down. You remember in the garden, he wanted them to pray. And they were too sleepy to pray. And he couldn't believe that they wouldn't pray. And in the, in the same garden, when he was betrayed, they all, even John, they all ran away. So it wasn't a perfect relationship, which is important to me. Because there's not a person in this room who has a perfect relationship with Jesus. It's ongoing. That's what relationships are like. They're a little messy. But even though you don't have a perfect relationship with Jesus, you can have the power turned on in your life. Are you with me? Number two, you have to be under right authority. I told you we we're going to move fast. We, ha we have to be under right authority before we can get the power turned on. Look at the next phrase in verse 4. He gave them this what? What? He gave them this command. Guys, listen to me. This idea of having the Holy Spirit's power working in your life, it's not just a good idea. It's a command. It's not like, you know, you really shouldn't try to live this Christian life in your own strength. It's not that. You can't live it in your own strength. It's not an option. This thing of turning on the power of God in your life, it's critical. Your spiritual life is at stake. The Holy Spirit's already working in your life because you couldn't even get saved without Him. Drawing you and wooing you. This thing is a command. Before you can turn on the power of God in your life, you got to be under authority. Are you with me? Number three, we have to be at the right place. We have to be at the right place before we can turn on the power. Look at verse four, the next four words. Do not leave what? Every disciple who wasn't where he should have been didn't get the power turned on that day. You had to be in Jerusalem. You had to be where Jesus wants you to be. Listen to your pastor. If you want the power of God turned on in your life, you got to be where Jesus wants you to be in every area of your life. You don't just surrender your sin. You surrender everything. Every area of your life is where God wants you to be. Are you with me? Number four, we have to be on the right time. We have to be on the right time. I want to show you the two hardest, meanest words in the English language. The very next two words. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Isn't that a pain in the neck? Wouldn't it be great if we could just erase that, you know, and just turn the Holy Spirit's power on in our life like a light switch? Wouldn't that be great? doesn't work that way. This thing happens on his time, not on our time. And you know what's a little amazing to me? I want to I tread here carefully. But it amazes me how sometimes some of us are willing to get up in the early morning before it's, the sun's even up, climb some stupid tree somewhere, and sit in a, in a tree, freezing our tail off, waiting for four hours for a deer to come by. And we can't wait on the Holy Spirit to come by. Or we go and we watch for an hour and a half, two hours, sometimes three hours in some movie theater. And we hang on every word of our favorite movie star, you know, and everything that he's doing. And we can't wait on the Holy Spirit to give us his word. When we go to the restaurant, we'll wait for 15, 20, 30 minutes if it's bad service for some waitress to give us our food. But we can't wait on God to give us his spiritual food. This turning on of the power has to be on his timetable. And I promise you, you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to get into your prayer closet and wait on him. Number five, we have to be in right attitude. Write that down. Before we can turn on the power, we got to be in right attitude. The next phrase of verse 4, for the gift of my father, the gift, the, for the gift my father promised. I'm going to get it out. 
It's a gift. A gift is something we desire. A gift is something that we are honored to receive. A gift is it's improper to try to earn a gift. And you know, the one dynamic you can't deny about a gift is that it can be rejected. And you know, there's a lot of Christians that are a little gun shy about this gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you know why? Because it's been misrepresented so poorly. There are the, I, we're a diverse group. We've got, we've got everything you can possibly imagine in this room as far as religious background. And there are some of us in this room a little anxious about this Holy Spirit stuff just because of what you've heard and how it's been misrepresented. When we picture Jesus, we picture a gentle shepherd. Am I right about it? When we picture Jesus, we picture someone who sacrificed for us and loved us and meets us where we're at. Am I right about it? The Holy Spirit is exactly like that. You don't have to be afraid of him, even when he's been misrepresented. Are we all right? It's a gift. We need to treat him like a gift that is desired. Number six, we have to be listening to the right message. Now, Pastor John, this is great preaching, man. Way to be. You are on target right here. Don't fall asleep at this. We have to be listening to the right message. The last phrase of verse 4, Jesus says, Which you have what? You have heard me what? Guys, if you're going to have the power of God's Spirit turned on in your life, you got to do a better job in the messages you're listening to. It makes a difference. I believe you can be working for the greatest company on the face of the earth, but sooner or later you're going to run into some slander, some negative thinking and talking and backbiting and backstabbing, and if you listen to that, you'll think you're in hell on earth. You could, be, you could be living in Mayberry. Mayberry what? Mayberry RFD? Is that what that was? Mayberry RFD? You know, where the worst thing is Barney upsetting Thelma Lou because he looked twice at some other girl or Otis can't find the keys to the jail cell. You could be living in Mayberry. But if you listen to the wrong messages, you'll think you're in hell. Guard your ears. You want God's power turned on in your life? you got to do a better job of what you're listening to. Oh, that's such good preaching. Oh, oh. I think I heard the bell ring there for a second. Number seven, we have to be following the right messenger. We have to be following the right messenger. Uh, the first phrase of verse five, for John baptized with what? John was the leading evangelist of his day, wasn't he? I mean, even Jesus said, no man greater, you know, anybody greater than woman has been greater than, uh, born of woman was, uh, was greater than John. And even Herod the Tetrarch listened to every word that John said. If there was a time man of the year, John would have been the times man of the year. There's just one thing wrong with John. What is it? He can't turn on the power. Only one person can turn on the power in your life, and it's not John. It's Jesus. you got to be careful who you follow. How many times, and I, I want to go down this a little carefully, how many times have we had great pastors come and go, and we, we embrace them, and they lead us into great areas of ministry, and we get all excited, and eventually they leave. You know, nothing stays the same. They leave. And all of a sudden, all that commitment to that ministry, all of a sudden, all that commitment to that conveying that message goes right down the tubes. Because we're following the wrong guy.
John's a great guy. John can't turn on the power. There's nothing wrong with, with following, you know, this guy or, or that guy. Just be careful who you follow and don't ever let him take Jesus' place. Because he's the only one that can turn on the power. Let's keep moving. Oh, thank you. I needed that. I needed that one person who was applauding right there. This is huge. Number eight. We have to have the right expectation. This is huge. The second half of verse 5 says, but in a few days, Jesus is still speaking, but in a few days you will be what? Baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know what Jesus is doing right there? He's filling his disciples with expectation. Hey guys, something's coming. Something's coming. You better get ready. They're excited. They're excited. Something, something else is coming along. And they're looking forward to it. Guys, I want to say this carefully. You know why some of you don't have the power turned on right now in your life? You have gotten satisfied with where you are. Do you know, do you know what I know about a man who complains about the kind of plate his food shows up on? Do you know what I know about the kind of man who complains about how his food is organized on the plate? Do you know what I know about the man who complains because his favorite meal wasn't on the plate? Do you know what I know about that guy? He's not hungry. Can I get a witness? That old boy lost his appetite because a hungry man doesn't care about any of that stuff. Just bring it as much as you can. All right? Some of us have lost our hunger. Listen, I don't care where you are in your journey with the Lord. There's more to discover. There is more, to, there is more ground to surrender. I don't care who you are. There's more of Christ to discover and more of God to surrender to. The minute you lose your appetite for what's coming is the minute the power goes off. No one has arrived in this room. Amen? Number what? We don't have to have all the right answers to get the power turned on in our life. We don't have to have all the right answers. Look at verse 6 and verse 7. Then the disciples gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Lord, at this time now, now that we're at the end, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? I can almost hear the sigh when that question was asked. I can almost hear, are you kidding me? Three years? Three years of pouring into you? And you ask that? There's... there's, there's no question, in the two, two things hit me in this verse. They, they don't have the right answers, and they're asking terrible questions. Jesus, now are you going to overthrow Rome and get Rome out of here and destroy you know, Caesar and get all these Herod boys out of here and restore David's throne so we can get back to normal? Are you kidding me? Have you heard nothing? But you know, he doesn't get ticked. You know why? You know why he doesn't get ticked? Because he understands the problem. The problem isn't their lack of understanding. The problem is their lack of power. Because when the Holy Spirit does come at Pentecost and the power gets turned on, they don't ask those stupid questions anymore. The only thing that matters to them is spreading the gospel and building the church. They didn't have it all figured out. Now that's encouraging to me. You know why? I don't have it all figured out. But that doesn't mean I can't have God's power turned on in my life. If we have to wait, yes, go ahead. If, thank you, Wanda. I've got Wanda. <laughs> Bless your heart. If we had to wait till we had it all figured out, no one's going to have power. 
to live this Christian life. You don't have to have all the answers. And then number 10, we're going to wrap this thing up because uh, I'm going I'm to prove to you that I can get you out on time. You pray for me, okay? We have, number 10, we have to have right motives. Before the power can get turned on, we have to have right motives. In verse 8 of uh, Acts 2, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my what? Witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Guys, do you remember some of the things the disciples argued about before the power got turned on in their life? Do you remember some of the things they bickered about amongst themselves? Who's the greatest? Remember that? Who's the greatest? You know? Remember when, uh, was it Peter and John, was it, that went to Jesus and said, hey, can I sit on your right? Can I sit on your left? And all the others got ticked. Not because, not because they asked the question. They got ticked because they beat them to it. See? They're all consumed about position. All consumed about title. All, all consumed about promotion. After the power of God comes on their life, they're just concerned about two things. Spreading the gospel. Building the church. All that carnal stuff fades away. That's important to me because there's people in this room right now. You're losing your peace over things like promotion and title and position. When we need to be focused on getting the power turned on and to be a witness, to take light to dark places. You know, these disciples, when they got the power turned on, they became the greatest evidence to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, I've made statements to you before. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the best documented event in the history of the world. But of all the, all the things that the, the scholars and the Christian apologists look at, the greatest evidence was the change in those cowardly disciples that are cowering behind closed doors, scared spitless, until they see two things. The resurrected Christ and the power of Pentecost. When the power came down. Something happened. Those boys went out and turned the world upside down. And they didn't stop till somebody killed them. Are you evidence of God's power? Are you evidence of, of Christ's resurrection? Is the power turned on? Back home, about 20 miles away from my hometown is a little town. It's never been, I don't think it's ever been bigger than 30 or 40,000. And it's, it, back in the day, it was, it was uh, only 3,000 people. It's called Wabash, Indiana. Any of you ever heard of Wabash, Indiana? Really? Matthew, I know you, <laughs> Matthew's from Marion. Debbie, you've heard of Wabash, Indiana? Okay. Wabash is, well, it's the county seat. It's, it's a very small town. Uh, you go back to the late 1800s, 1880s. It's before the era of electricity. And the town council approached a man by the name of Charles Burke to bring this light bulb he's been experimenting with. It was the arc light bulb one light bulb could replace about 3,000 light candle power. 3,000 candles. And uh, there wasn't a city on the face of the earth that was lit by electricity. It was all oil and, uh, and uh, yes, natural gas and you have candles. I'm, it's not it, but I'm running with it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And they, and, and they uh, considered an investment of $1,800 to light Wabash with electricity, with these light bulbs. 
A lot of, a lot of them disagreed with it. A lot of them said it was pie in the sky. Uh, some of the newspapers had editorials saying the only people that want this is, is the small majority of people on the town council. This is ridiculous. Uh, one, uh, one editorial said that if we light, you know, Wabash bright at night, it's going to kill every bird in the county because birds sleep at night. And, and we'll lose all of our chickens because they won't sleep at night. We'll, all, all the birds, all the fowl in Wabash County will die if we go to electricity. They, they take this step. They put four of these lights on a pole right in front of the county courthouse. 10,000 people have arrived. Over three times the population of the town. 19 city councils from all over the world have come to watch. On March 8th, 1880, Wednesday night, dark and cold and drizzly night, at 8 o'clock sharp, they turn on the lights for the first time in history in street lights. It was a light the on that could only be exceeded by the light of the sun. It wasn't blinding light. It was like moonlight. It was so bright, 10,000 people stood stunned. Nobody said a word. You could hardly hear people breathe. One man, 50 years later, as a boy, uh, a doctor, a medical doctor in town, said he remembered five miles away being shocked at seeing the shadow of a horse and buggy on the ground at that moment. There was a farmer who came out of his barn and looked towards town, saw this light, went nuts, started screaming at the top of his voice. He thought Jesus was returning. He ran into his, his farmhouse screaming, Mary, Mary, get on your knees, it's the end of the world! You know. The Western Union Telegraph went crazy. It didn't stop all night long. Right there on the spot, the Royal British Navy had, had people there to see. They made a contract with this guy on the spot for 437 of these bulbs on their ships out at sea. Before the year was over, the same guy had a contract to light up Broadway from 4th Street all the way to 37th Street in New York City. And you know the rest of the story. Now listen. Wabash wasn't the biggest city in the state. Wabash wasn't the richest city in the state. Wabash wasn't the most influential city. It didn't have any titles. Just county seat. But Wabash changed the world when they turned on the power. Never the same again. Guys, can you hit the lights for me? It's going to get dark, guys. It's going to get dark. Just stay tight. I was hoping that light was going to be out, but that's okay. See that light behind me? Jesus sent his son to penetrate the darkness. We celebrate that every Sunday, but we especially celebrated it last Sunday. There is darkness all over this valley. People live in the dark. There's pain in the dark. There's confusion and there's loneliness in the dark. Here's the thing, I'm going to throw you a curveball. That light isn't quite enough. There's another, there's another light required. My light's required. Jesus calls me to be an extension of that light. And send this light into dark places. 
this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Come on, guys. Help me with this light. Won't let Satan blow it out. Come on. I'm going to let, there you go, shine. Lift it. Won't let Satan blow it out. Need some more lights, guys. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it stand up with it. Stand up with it. Shine all over Roanoke. I'm going to let it shine. Bum, bum, bum. Shine all over Roanoke. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Now, Lord Jesus, you see all these lights. Just as the light of our phones are penetrating the darkness of this room, I'm asking you, help us to turn on the power so that our light goes into the darkest corners of our Jerusalem and our Judea and our Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Help us turn on the power. Let's give him a round of praise. Come on, let's give him a good round of praise. You are the best there is. Go get them and don't trip in the dark. You're dismissed.